We are on chapter 3. And we'll be beginning with verse 11. But just to draw us back to this point, you remember the chapter opens with Arjuna asking Krishna, which of the two, wisdom or action, is the higher path? And of course, Krishna then allows us to learn that neither of the two can exist without the other. We cannot act rightly until we have the wisdom. And that wisdom will not be ours until we learn how to achieve that state of even-mindedness within. And then we got to the point where Krishna shares with us that turning point where, how can my action, because Krishna is constantly saying, do it without the desire for the fruit of your actions, do it in a way that you're completely detached from the action itself. And finally, he gives us the key where he says, O son of Kunti, therefore perform your duty without attachment in a spirit of religious self-offering. Then he goes a step further where he says, Prajapati brought mankind into manifestation and in so doing gave man the potential for self-offering into a higher awareness through Yajna. Along with his gift, he said to mankind, Whatever you desire, seek it by offering energy back to the source of all energy. Let this sacrifice, let this yagya be your cow of fulfillment. So this is where we left it in our last class. He then continues. With this offering, commune with the devas that they may commune with you also. Through such mutual communion, you will arrive at the highest good. Now, there are a few key words here that we should be you know, focusing on before we continue. First and foremost, I want to conf- focus on the word yagya, which loosely translates into sacrifice. But of course, it's, a, it's an entire process. It's an entire process of offering. However, the word sacrifice is a very beautiful word because it suggests that it's not easy. It suggests that there is, there is a certain <laughs> pain in the process of giving back. It's not just, you know, oh, sure. Oh, you are? Sure, sure. This, I'm not using this anyway. It suggests that you're giving something that's meaningful to you and that it's not just Oh, I give my thanks and oh, how wonderful. Oh, you give me so much money. Oh, how wonderful. You know, and I have done my sacrifice. Oh, and I'm just going to, yeah, of course, I'll do my puja in the morning. And that's my great sacrifice. You know, and that's not it, of course. And then, of course, let's go down to the next where he talks about the devas. Now, this concept of the devas is always a little confusing. Now, in the Vedic understanding, of course, brought to us from Satya Yoga, from this really high Um, state of consciousness where the majority of mankind is so aware that the the veil that separates the you know creation with the divine is so thin that you can see so easily the hand of these higher beings in absolutely everything and so this Vedic lifestyle is nothing but natural living for them because they're communing communing is not some sort of deep like Okay, let me see, let me see if I can, it's, it's communicating. Oh, hi, Indra. What about some rain today? You know, so that communication is very clear, very clean, very easy. Just because the state of awareness that most of mankind had at that time was so high that it didn't take much. Of course, as we then entered into these descending yugas where consciousness got more and more limited in its ability to express, then these took on much more ritualistic processes where again, the the symbology in the rituals were very deep, very clear. What you offer, when you offer the mantras, the vibration, the energy, the amount of time it took to do this. I mean, the sacrifice of just, I mean, days at a time, the amount of energy it took, the amount of feeding of the masses that have to happen, the amount of giving away that had to happen was was large. So you see the exchange that was going on. It wasn't like you give me something great and, you know, maybe I'll throw some rice balls into the fire. I I just, the, um, the exchange was very fair. 
And so we need to look at what are these devas now? And the devas are these astral beings, entities, it's hard to really call them. They don't necessarily have the shape or form that we would otherwise assign them, but they can assume a shape or form for they are not limited the way we are, but they are that absolute highest manifestation of that ideal. If you're seeking success, the absolute highest vision of that success is the deva of success. If you're seeking to commune with the ability to grow a bountiful crop, the absolute, the energy and the power within that crop that will enliven it is the deva of the crop. So that way man is able to tune in. So what happens to us? Now I'm seeking success, right? I have two ways. I can commune with the absolute highest form of that success and create a relationship with that, offering back something in return for what I receive. And then I'm able to actually achieve that state of success. What happens for us is that absolute highest vibration of success, that deva, when it trickles down manifesting through us, through the filter of our own consciousness, through the filter of our ego, through the filter of our likes and dislikes, all the attachments we have. Finally, what comes out is, you know, that version of success, depending on from which point it has filtered out into our lives. So if we communicate directly, we can draw because here, what is Krishna saying? Again, in no way is he saying, you know, be absolutely poor and be pathetic and, you know, just have to negate everything about the world. He's like, through such mutual communion, you will arrive at the highest good. You could possibly live the most fulfilled, absolutely elevated life that you want, provided you know where that's coming from, provided you learn that language of the devas, of the source, of that vibration in the astral realm from which the energy, from which success is even created, which money is even created, which relationships are created, from where love comes, from where joy comes. And if you can tune into those higher forms, you'll be able to communicate, commune and receive from that level. But then he goes on to say what that, what that exchange is like. By communion with the devas, you will receive from them the fulfillments you desire. He who enjoys the gifts of the gods without returning due offering of energy to them is verily a thief. Ouch! So, th this, one's, you know, this one's worth pondering over. I mean, Krishna is pretty much <laughs> calling most of us a thief. And he, rightly so. I mean, if it, if it hurts here, it's because <laughs> there's truth to it. Because how many of us understand this process, this reality? I mean, do any of us go into a store, pick up whatever we want and just walk out? I mean, is it, isn't it the most obvious most clear reality that there is value and a certain value is returned. There's energy, a certain energy is returned. I know this is what I want. It's very clear. I know what I want. I want this chips and I want this toothpaste and I want this bread. And, and I then create an exchange that allows me to receive this and take it back with me. However, when it comes to life and when it comes especially to spiritual teachings and spiritual knowledge and wisdom and vibration being received, somehow we feel this law not only doesn't apply, it shouldn't apply. That I should be able to just walk into my spiritual path and just take. I mean, the audacity of our being is that we feel we have to give nothing in return. Do you really believe that if you don't offer seva in return to the source of that inspiration, you will gain anything? Do you really believe if you don't give financial support, allow such a thing to even exist and grow and expand, that you will receive something? It's not that God wants to hold divine knowledge from you. It is that His laws exist 
His laws exist just to sustain us. Narayani had done an affirmation recently on gratitude, in which Swami Kriyananda said, Gratitude is energy given for energy received. Only a thief will take without giving in return. And Narayani talked about how our very being, I mean, if I have to inhale, I have to exhale. There's this natural process of receiving, giving, receiving, giving. Goes into my body, comes out of my body. There's this constant there is no concept in the entire universe of a taking or of only giving either. Both exist and both have to be given their due. And most of us are too hungry, too greedy, too limited and fearful in the losing that we only want to fill ourselves. When, I, when we look at people's lives and we see, because it's hard to fully understand this law, because we look at people and, you know, it's like I see people who don't give much but have and receive a lot. And you see people who give a lot and don't receive a lot. And so it, it makes us doubt this law greatly. But no one would have received now if they had not given before. I mean, impossible. As impossible as, you know, for the sun and the moon to change their positions right now in the sky. It's that impossible for that person who is receiving right now to have not before given. When we came into manifestation, when life and consciousness was breathed into us, the first thing we did whether it was stepping into the world, relating to the world, is first to give to the world. Give our attention, give our energy, give our awareness. And that's when essentially Maya begins. It begins from our first giving. Creation begins from the giving and then the receiving begins. And then that process starts to keep balancing itself out. So it's extremely important for us to Tune into especially this. I mean, let's listen to this again, what Krishna says, because it's important. He who enjoys the gifts of the gods without returning due offering to them is verily a thief. How, how much of in our own lives, look at your relationships, look at your business, look at anything and everything, and, and think about that relationship and say, how much do I give? We have a, a beautiful a friend, very uh, newly, who's come into our lives. And she doesn't live in India. She lives in the United Kingdom. And she was with us a few months back, just for what, a week? Yeah, she was, you know, she visited us for a week. She had, she'd been connecting with us for a, through the internet in little ways. She had a concession with Narayani and whatever. It was just, it was a brief moment. But it was enough for her to realize, I mean, there was just, just, wow, I found my path. What can I now give? I mean, just like I'm this so outpouring of wanting to give. And she's not with us here. She's in another country entirely. But in so many ways, she's doing more than many of us are doing. To bring the inspiration she feels by giving back. And you see such a person and you say, it's like, what, what, what more do, do we need to do? It's done. They've gotten it. Mm -hmm. It's over. Now nothing's going to stop them. Now they're going to receive and no one's needed. We're not needed in this process. This Gita is not needed in this process. It's just, they got it. And when you get to that point where there is not even the thought anymore of what will I receive and there is only the thought of what can I give, it's like it's over. The, the path is, it's one. And that's so important. And when Krishna is bringing our attention to this, I mean, the words he's using, they're strong. I mean, he's calling us a thief. He's not just saying that's wrong, you know, it would be better if we were also offering in return. You know, it would be nice for you. It would, it would help you if you gave. No, no, no. 
Pay either you're a thief <laughs> or you're not. And this is something very important for us to keep in mind and for you to keep in mind. If you feel you're spiritually stagnating, if you feel you are not receiving enough, look no further than what you give. That will tell you the entire story. And not what you give, ki haan, maine haan paisa de diya and did this and I did. You know, what you give, where your mind is, how much you think about giving. Uh, uh, teacher in Ananda, many of you know her, Naya Swami Asha, she so uh, kind of humorously said, but so rightly, because we should come back to the words sacrifice. She said, when you're writing your check for your monthly donation, if it doesn't hurt while you write it, if, if you don't get nervous while you write it, if you're not like fearful, right, then, then what you're giving is, you're not really giving. Because sure, I can give 10,000 rupees. It's no big deal because I have so much. But if I give a lakh, that makes me feel like a little worried. And then I know it's a sacrifice. You see, then I know yagya is happening. And that's what we need to learn. What is giving and what is yagya? Once we learn that, you see how the tables will begin to turn instantaneously. Spiritually minded people offering up the food they eat to its source in divine energy, to the devas, incur no sin. Those, however, who make no such offering, eating only for taste and pleasure, are verily feeding on sin. Now again, we should look at the word sin because it's not as we tend to think as evil, as something that's, you know, just wrong and bad. Sin means anything that binds us more and more into the ego. Anything essentially that creates karma, that becomes sinful in, in this particular context especially. So, of course, whatever we put into our body, this is again another flow of offering. Whatever we offer this body, it's going to affect the body. It's going to incur karmic sin depending on the nutrients, the quality of the food, the energy, the vibration, uh, vegetarian, non-vegetarian, all those levels that exist. But he who, in the eating, offers it up to the divine. None of that, otherwise that could have been detrimental to your process. You will only take the absolute highest. And that's the deva, the highest manifestation of any food, of any nutrient, no matter if it has chemicals, pesticides, no matter if it's even meat. Because you're not eating it. As you're eating it, you're offering. There's this beautiful story, um, I believe, in the Srimad Bhagavatam, but I could be mistaken, where uh, these uh, gopis and gopals, they're all uh, coming to want to bring Krishna, his most favorite, you know, paneer and his curds, and he loved his dairy products, like, uh, <laughs> like me you. very much. If you're <laughs> vegan, don't worry, he, that's not a big deal. Um, and they had to cross a river to get across to where Krishna was. And normally there would be a boatman there, but today they come and there is nobody to help them across. But they see sitting by the banks, Ved Vyas. And they know him to be a great man, a rishi, and they know he could help them. And so they go to Ved Vyas and they say, you know, Krishna is, our beloved Krishna is across the other bank. Won't you help us go there because it's our time to feed him. It's his feeding time. He's waiting for us. And Ved Vyas is like looking at the stuff they have brought and he says, what do you have there? And they say, oh, we've got his favorite cheeses and his curds and his whatnots. And Ved Vyas says, well, um, I'm happy to help you, but you know, it's just like, what do I get? What are you going to give me in this process? I see everything's for Krishna, but what about me? You're asking me for my help. And so they very reluctantly, you know, give Vedvya some curds. They offer him stuff and he just starts eating and he's like eating and eating and eating and eating. And he's eaten more than half of the food, the offering they bought for Krishna. And finally he says, okay, now I'm satisfied. And he goes to the river and he says to the river, Yamuna, this is by the Yamuna. If I have not eaten anything, 
divide up and part and all the devotees are like what a liar <laughs> it's just like yamuna is not going to listen to him he's eaten so much but immediately yamuna parts and they're very surprised because not only has this beautiful miracle occurred but it's occurred under such unusual circumstances with from a lying rishi <laughs> and they get across and they get to krishna and normally krishna would come running out to them because he's so hungry he's so happy to see them but they come and they find krishna sleeping and they say krishna we've come we i'm sorry we're a little late but here your food and and krishna says oh you know don't disturb me i'm just i'm just i want to rest you know how i need to rest after i've eaten they say but you've not eaten no no i'm really full like who brought you food oh that guy across the river he fed me so much cheese and so much paneer and so much butter and so much curd and i'm so full and they then realized what vedvyas was doing he wasn't eating anything that's why when he said to yamuna if i have not eaten anything divide up and part because as he was eating it he was offering it to krishna and it was krishna who was eating it through him so you see that there's such beautiful stories to help us realize how we just go about life so not aware kare you know i just i just want to eat and pleasure and i just want to fill my senses and get them stimulated and not even realizing that how much sin how much karma all of that involves in our being and all we have to do simply while you're offering it to the body immediately offer it to god to the source of all power of all nutrition of all sustenance and then only the best will be absorbed by the body everything else will be offered up krishna in fact will hand pick that which is bad from within your food and he will consume it just so that you don't have to creatures require nourishment from food food must be nourished by rain rain is sustained in turn by fire fire here of course means the heat as what are evaporates by it and heat is produced by the vibration of om know this divine vibratory activity to have been produced by brahma the cosmic creative force yagya or sacrificial self offering brings the great cycle of cosmic manifestation back at last to itself you see in doing so i mean look at this this is actually it's huge in this little act of self offering what we are doing is we are bringing cosmic manifestation back to its original point we're essentially dissolving creation in these little ways and in essence we are dissolving the karma that creation creates within us we can you imagine how powerful that thought is and we we think away just oh yeah giving blessing loving puja and it's just like we have no idea the power that god has bestowed us with we have the power brahma has and our power is to actually return it back to the source rather than getting consumed by it in the creation in this world but think about that that cycle and let's look at that food comes from rain comes from fire comes from vibration of om brahma creates om and so as we return everything back to the source we bring creation back to its original point and everything collapses back into itself back into that singularity expressed duality by the giving by the receiving from neutralized completely you see how karma is being neutralized by these very actions of ours but this by acting outwardly in maya we are neutralizing maya i mean there's so much power within us but also look at the way krishna explains it food the physical form is fed by water fed by fire fed by om so he's talking essentially about how how creation also came in so there's a deeper esoteric reality here because our chakras represent these elements earth water fire air ether consciousness spirit here he's clubbing om which is ether om and akash and air he's clubbing that vibratory power together 
but he's essentially also saying one of the ways or really the way to make a true offering is up the spine because from the manifested world comes from the water it comes from the fire it comes from om and so if we can move back up in the opposite way as we offer ourselves back to brahma here then we're there and then all of creation finally neutralizes within us and let's take the last stanza because it's so beautiful ooh unfortunately not the last ah i wanted to say this i'm go- i'm going to jump ahead to stanza 22 even though right now we are in stanza 15 because here krishna gives us just this beautiful moment where he says o son of pritha no further duty compels me there is no state left for me to attain and nothing in the three worlds for me to gain yet still i work i work on for the upliftment of others there where all upliftment uplifting work is done am i one really subtle thing here is krishna talks about the fact that there is no further duty left that compels me there is no higher state left for me to attain there is nothing for me to gain now which suggests what to us it suggests that krishna as well has perfected his consciousness through the same route he is offering us now when we think of god and we think of krishna and we think of these avatars of vishnu we tend to think of them as these perfect manifested beings beings they didn't have to do what they're what we're having to do we're just at their mercy but no krishna is talking about because krishna is a self realized master and krishna is talking about now i don't have to do this anymore because i've gone through this process and i've perfected myself through this process now nothing remains think of that state for yourself no further duty <coughs> compels you there is no state left for you to attain and there is nothing in the three worlds for you to gain however yet you still work on for the upliftment of others and wherever uplifting work is being done there you are isn't that the state we should all aspire towards isn't that the state that these great masters have brought to us nothing compels them yet they come again and again for us work suffer get betrayed have to make money have to go through disease have to when I mean, they take on all delusion as their own just to show us that it can be overcome that nothing binds us that freedom is ours anyway beautiful words beautiful um session today i, I feel yeah <laughs> narayani you have some words to add i think you have explained it beautifully there is not much to add add except how are we going to practice this throughout this week that's the real question how shall i serve you how shall i love you how shall i worship you how shall i give you back and today is actually almost the essence of the spiritual path because we really need to seriously stop for a moment and very dispassionately you know very impersonally see where are the areas of our lives where we are receiving more than we are giving and see where where there is the imbalance there and try to repair that imbalance and balance or imbalance 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 as quickly as possible if we really want for the energy of the universe flow freely in our lives so this is going to be like a excruciating process is that how it's called 
a scrutiny. A scrutiny. <laughs> <laughs> it's also going to be an excruciating process. Or excruciating. <laughs> and see, you know, in your relationships, who are those people who are really giving you their love fully, wholeheartedly, 100%, loyal to you all the time by your side, taking care of you? And what are you giving back to that loving energy that you are receiving? For, you know, to those people who are daily feeding you, perhaps your maid, your cook, who are constantly making sure that every day you have your three meals lovingly prepared with care. I mean, what are you giving back to that source of nourishment? To your spiritual, you know, where are you receiving spiritual inspiration and what is keeping you uplifted throughout this period? I mean, and, and how much are you gaining and receiving and how much are you giving back to that source of inspiration to, I mean, this goes on and on. The person that comes home and makes sure that your house always is uplifted and sad big and clean. What, what are you doing in exchange for that energy of, you know, cleanliness that is coming into your life? So, there are many things that we need to, you know, stop and see how can we match that energy that we are receiving. And if everything is an act of offering, I like to see in my own life, everything that I do, everything I offer in whatever form, whether it is financial, whether it is through Seva, whether it is through giving things away, as prasad that I'm offering to the divine. So every thought, every action, every word, every financial support that we do to other communities, to other NGOs, to Ananda itself, it's an act of offering. And this is something that Shurjo and I try to follow to the T every month. I mean, every month, Shurjo and I make sure that we also contribute financially to Ananda Mumbai because we need to practice these teachings. We, we, we are living these principles. In fact, whenever we feel we are receiving a lot of any kind, we make sure we share that with other communities. Whenever we receive inspiration, from Ananda Village in California, from Ananda Palo Alto, all the videos they are doing from other communities, which is, it's like almost, we, is, there is a need, we must give something back in whatever form, that will be up to you to decide, but we need to start valuing what God is bringing into our lives. And, and the more we just, you know, make um, the balance needs to be in equilib equilibrium and only then really true spirituality will be lived and understood at its highest so yeah roll up your sleeves and get to work and start repairing those leaks that some of us have in areas of our lives Especially in your meditation. Yeah, actually. That's yeah. a big one. You yeah. know, if you feel you're not receiving enough, yeah. it's because we don't put out a lot of energy mm -hmm. in our meditations. And so really you have to be offering yourself in meditation. It's not just going to trickle into us one fine day. You know, so when you sit there, your concentration, your posture, your energy, your conviction, your dedication, I mean, all of that is so vital to having a successful meditation, to, to begin to break that dam of receiving. And um, that's an important one in our spiritual practices because most people don't give enough energy to their practices. And this also applies to your prayers. 
how generous are you in praying for other people when we ask, you know, to other people to pray for us, to keep us in, you know, in their prayers. I mean, how much also are we giving back? Are we also praying for them? So there is a constant exchange of energy that is happening like 24 seven hours. And this is not something that we want to scare you with, <laughs> but just to be aware that there is so much that we can do beyond our hour, half an hour, you know, two hours meditation. There is, there is so much that, that, so many miracles that we can create in our lives and the real power lies within us. All right, let's end, as always, with the invocation and the chanting of Om. And let's just feel, again, as this Om is coming into us, let's go through all the things Narayani said. You know, let's offer into the Om first our convictions of what we're going to do, how we're going to rectify those aspects of our lives that we feel and especially look to the places where you think you're not receiving enough and then really see how can you give somewhere else to break because energy is just going to come from to you depending on what you put out period so now really look into it and as the ohm is being offered because it will lift your consciousness up to a point where you can see this as narayani said see it dispassionately you know, don't even see it. What can I gain? What can I gain? This is not the game here. Just see it dispassionately and, and correct whatever needs to be corrected from that point. Mm -hmm.